Hello everyone, I'm Paris Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to 12 O'Clock High, a podcast on business leadership with Tom Fox, hosted by Richard Lummis. What makes a great leader? Is it genetic or can you learn leadership skills? Join Tom Fox and Richard Lummis in this podcast, where they consider leadership from a wide variety of perspectives, academic, behavioral science, history, popular culture, the movies, and much more. You'll learn about specific tactics and strategies that you can bring to your own leadership toolkit. 12 O'Clock High is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to another episode of 12 O'Clock High, a podcast about leadership. This is Richard Lummis and I'm here with Tom Fox for another discussion on how to improve our leadership skills. We believe leadership is a skill which can be improved with study of both good and bad practices and we try to draw interesting examples from many sources including history, fiction, film, and business writing. Welcome back, Tom. Today we'll be discussing the story of Uber, and especially that of its founder, Travis Kalanick. The new book out, Super Pump, The Battle for Uber, by New York Times reporter Mike Isaac, provides a detailed history. And I recommend it a lo- as a lot of fun, but it also raises some pretty serious questions about leadership and corporate culture and governance that go well beyond Uber and the Silicon Valley venture capital tech bubble. It suffers a little bit from having too many great stories to tell and having to have been written and released quickly to capitalize on the timeliness of the subject. But a quick recap, um, smartphones really changed the world, and ride-sharing with Uber started as a niche using downtime for black cars uh, and livery services which were licensed. So basically rich people always had a workaround to the taxi cartels in cities. When they expanded Uber to UberX and basically had a whole bunch of independent contractor drivers who were not licensed by the city, is when uh, things really started to go south for them, I think, and that they, uh, they ran afoul of the city governments and regulators in virtually every city they were in. So um, it's kind of hard to know where to start. I'll give you a quick recap. The... Um, of the collapse. What happened was, right after Trump was elected uh, and instituted what's been called the Muslim ban, there were protests at the New York City airports, and taxi drivers went on strike in support of the protests. Uber's New York management made the snap decision to uh, not institute surge pricing, which some people interpreted as an attempt to break the strike and as support for Trump. And so that began the delete Uber movement, hashtag delete Uber, which for whatever reason seemed to have some psychological trigger on Kalanick. A couple of months later, um, a woman named Susan Fowler, who had left Uber after being sexually harassed, made a blog post about her very strange year at Uber, which only made things worse. It's followed by a series of unforced errors, including hiring Eric Holder to, uh, to investigate the culture of the company, and uh, they gave him no budget and no time or subject constraints, which basically meant they were going to find something. And they also had a lot of skeletons in the closet. So, um, Following that, there were some other issues. He basically drove out the head lawyer, um, Sally Yu, um, over what he felt was her lack of loyalty, but it cost him a key supporter. And then uh, some of the venture capitalists who'd been early supporters uh, basically began to question Kalanick's judgment and the lack of controls at the company. Um, Let's see, other issues... I guess we need to talk about are the uh, the whole cult of personality surrounding Kalanick. Tom, what do you think about this? So, uh, for those listening, um, if it's not clear already, uh, we're going to turn the tables today because I get to interview Richard, and uh, he gave a great uh, summary of uh, kind of the book and uh, the uh, trajectory or downward spiral of founder Travis uh, Kalanick, and uh, we wanted to use this episode to to introduce the topic of the true visionary founder and use that perhaps um, some of the examples we recently uh, have come across in the 
in the greater cultural world to explore not only leadership, but some issues around corporate governance and how can you move from a uh, startup, an extraordinarily successful startup uh, in the tech field or other, into a, a grown-up corporation that goes IPO and is listed on the, uh, the premier stock exchange in the world, the New York Stock uh, Exchange. And Uber really, uh, I think, um, in many ways, was one of, uh, if not the first, one of the first large tech startups where we had this uh, blow up uh, around, uh, if I can pick up on your last phrase, Richard, the cult of personality. This is not to say, obviously, Steve Jobs did not have the same issue. Steve Jobs uh, left Apple, famously came back and uh, took the company to completely new heights. So uh, the model is there for success. Uh, but some of the things that you detailed and some of the things that uh, stories that came out from the book uh, I think point to um, uh, what can go, what can happen when you take the dark side, and um, the the cult of personality. Uh, I was trying to think of an example uh, in my professional career. Um, I think we have both worked for difficult people, but difficult person uh, uh, does not equate to a cult of personality. So I can't really point to one person who I've worked for that I thought really uh, had that. Um, Steve Jobs, as I said, is, is probably in our generation one of the most famous, uh, and he certainly was able to get people to do things, uh, be disruptive in a way that drove stakeholder value, drove shareholder value, uh, was incredibly innovative. Uh, it probably was not very pleasant to be around. Nevertheless, I think people felt a great sense of accomplishment with that. My sense around Kalanick was early on in Uber, people felt the same way, and they felt that they really were doing something, uh, perhaps not changing the world as, as some, um, some of the other people we may talk about, but certainly changing the dynamic in a economic system, transportation system that has existed uh, for at least 100 years and maybe even before that uh, in terms of uh, cabs, liveries. Uh, regulations on the local level and the uh, barriers to entries uh, to getting into that market. Um, so um, it, 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 it's not clear to me uh, if Uber could have succeeded without him, without his cult of personality, without uh, some of the things that I hope you'll talk about in terms of ignoring regulators and and uh, what they used to call principled confrontation. Uh, and how that might move forward. But uh, around the cult of the personality, how do you see that as a necessary evil or necessary part of uh, the extraordinary growth of, of Uber or other tech startups? Well, I don't think it's even necessarily evil. But, for instance, the, um, the charisma of the founder is kind of key in particularly raising money and in motivating people to work when you don't have a lot of money. And so I think providing that vision of changing the world, and they really did think they were changing the world, and they still um, have that idealism that this is Uber is just a step towards self-driving cars and the delivery of all sorts of items and just completely changing the economy. Um, one of the things that did happen was that in a previous incarnation, uh, Kalanick felt he'd been totally screwed over by Mike Ovitz, which I'm sure shocks anyone who's familiar with Mr. Ovitz's history. Shocking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, but so anyway, he started out with a very adversarial uh, mindset towards his, his capital sources, which I think is a little bit unusual. Um, his hostility towards the regulators and so forth, I think, is part of that disruptive personality that is, is actually quite positive in this case. You just couldn't get it done without somebody like him. Um, but it did bleed over into other areas, the, the uh, hostility, the us-against-the-world attitude. And I don't know how you can draw that line effectively. Um, what about some of the excesses? that uh, Kalanick, if not allowed, promoted. And I know those make for somewhat salacious stories, uh, but are there any leadership lessons around uh, some of the stories that I think we're both familiar with and are de more further detailed in the book? Well, the um, there are some lessons. Um, 
they hired people and gave them a great deal of independence, which is, uh, I thought, again, productive up to a point, but then it became uh, destructive. The excesses in, in Uber were actually, when we look at some some of our other cases, not that excessive, um, but they were offensive. Um, there was an instance in Korea involving a karaoke bar and basically girls with numbers on them who were being sold as escorts. And uh, and Kalanick and his second-in-command, Emil Michael, um, actually didn't stay long and didn't participate and left, but they didn't fire anybody and they, there was no discipline. Part of that problem is that as a startup company, their entire HR focus was on recruiting new people. They didn't really care about retaining people. In fact, they drove out people that they felt were not hard charging enough. But um, as a result, they, the, the Fowler uh, incident came up because she was harassed. She, let, she reported it to HR, who did absolutely nothing. They said the guy had never done it before, and they'd reprimand him and so forth. And then a couple of months later, she found out, no, he was a serial offender, and he had done it again. And actually, he was fired um, a couple of months after uh, the incident with her. But it was too late, and she was furious about it, and she should have been. So in terms of the uh, delete Uber movement, um, the... if. Let me see if we could uh, go into the facts about that a little bit more. As I recall, that occurred at or about the time of Trump's first Muslim ban. Yes. The uh, New York taxi drivers uh, went on uh, an informal uh, strike um, saying they would not go to the airport uh, to uh, deliver people. And Uber uh, continued to make transits to the airport, and somehow that was uh interpreted by the greater public as a support of Trump's policy. Is that basically it? That is it, but what's also interesting is that Lyft was doing it too, but they didn't get in trouble for it. So apparently it was one guy, and I think he was in Chicago, um, who, who tweeted this whole thing and it went viral, but he interpreted it that way because Trump's PR person, um, a woman named Rachel uh, Whetstone had suggested that he get on board one of Trump's council of uh, business advisors. Right, and so that was a, so that was interpreted as support for all of Trump's policies when it was really just an attempt to be at the table rather than on the menu. And then the um, uh, the series of unforced errors that we saw, I think, in the this was now in late winter, into the spring of uh, 2017, leading to his uh, departure as CEO uh, from the company. You mentioned the Holder Report, uh, which really unearthed some pretty bad and damning details and stories that had not made it to the greater public press at that point, perhaps known well uh, in the Recode world or Silicon Valley. But um, uh, s- some civil li- potential civil liability, some potential criminal liability, and uh, some people looking uh, bad. Well, that's to put it mildly. The um, their handling of a rape case in India was utterly appalling. Um, they got a detective and got hold of the woman's medical records, and the head of Asia Pacific was apparently carrying them around in his briefcase for several months. And uh, anyway, that cost them a few million bucks. Um, the other thing that popped up was the uh, the self driving car. When Uber announced, or when uh, Google announced that they had a self-driving car initiative, um, it's under the uh, leadership of a guy named Anthony Lewandowski, and he eventually fell out with Google and went and formed his own company, Auto, in the court prior to which he had downloaded all of the relevant files at Google onto a thumb drive and then erased his computer, and uh, somehow those files translated to the new startup. Google found out about it, um, but before that happened, um, Uber had purchased the company then called Auto for six hundred and eighty million dollars, one hundred and twenty million of which would have gone straight to Lewandowski. And as is routine, there was a due diligence report on that that uncovered the fact that he'd stolen all these files. 
but somehow that report never made it to the board. Kalanick seems to indicate that he never saw the report and blames the lawyers, but um, that, that remains a little murky. Well, that really leads uh, to another area I wanted to explore with you, which is uh, corporate governance more generally. Uh, you mentioned super voting rights. I'd like to perhaps uh, also talk about the board's role in in this process leading up to uh, Kalanick leaving um, the CEO role. But uh, I know the super voting rights have been around probably as long as stock companies have, have, have existed. And the one I, I've always studied was the Ford Motor Company when they went mm-hmm. public. The Ford family kept uh, what they called, I think, uh, A stock, yeah. and then the rest of us got B stock. And uh, there was some multiple on the A stock in terms of uh, voting rights so that the Ford family for some period of time still control the Ford Motor Company. I don't think they do anymore, but uh, they still hold uh, the A class, class A stock. How is super voting rights different than other stock schemes that we've seen in history? It's not that it's different so much as um, it was not prevalent until very recently in Silicon Valley, and I think that's kind of interesting. The venture capitalists uh, basically wouldn't allow it for many years because they're putting up all the money at risk. And it's only recently that they started doing that. I think Uber was one of the first to, to have it. Now, let me stop you there, because you have been both a venture capitalist and a receiver of venture capital. So you've negotiated on both sides. Why would someone lending money allow uh, basically no voting rights? Or conversely, how easy is a sell that? Well, <laughs> to sell that? <laughs> I think it's been very difficult to sell. But what happened, I think, in this case, and especially with Uber, which... Frankly, I mean, it's a brilliant idea, and people who use it are, are addicted to the service. But I think it is the FOMO factor, fear of missing out. And about this time, in addition to the venture capitalists in Silicon Valley who'd been involved in tech for the previous three or four decades, there was a flood of money coming in from New York and some from overseas um, because everybody wanted in on the next... Apple or Microsoft or whatever, and, and Uber was a unicorn. I mean, it's uh, everyone saw the potential of that business, and they wanted to be in. And Kalanick's price of admission was, among other things, uh, the super voting rights. But for instance, he made the venture capitalists come to his office and and make their pitch, and he only saw a limited number of them, and they they fought to get in to offer Uber money. So he really structured it very craftily, I think. Does this uh, really uh, also be a part of kind of the opaqueness of the corporate governance structure uh, that we're going to talk about in in perhaps some other um, uh, startups? Or was it just simply he controlled the board uh, because he controlled the 51% of the voting rights? Well, first of all, everyone on the board believed in him. Uh, That was, you know... He was, he was that charismatic, and it was that good an idea. But there were some really worrisome things. They haven't had a CFO since 2015. And some people on the board were starting to get really nervous about that, especially after they lost over a billion dollars um, on a car leasing debacle. Um, and uh, no one seemed to know who was responsible or where the money went. Um, uh, things like that. And... Prior to his ouster, Kalanick was apparently searching for a, an operating officer um, to help sort of grow up the company, I guess. Um, but again, some of this is probably uh, retroactive posturing. The, um, you mentioned the uh, uh, Lewin, uh, Lewandowski. Yeah, Lewandowski. Lewandowski and um, the self-driving car. Uh, Lewandowski has now been criminally indicted for theft of trade secrets from um, Google. Uh, it's extraordinarily unusual that there be a criminal indictment for the theft of trade secrets. It's it's generally viewed as civil liability, uh, but here we uh, it was certainly taken up a notch. Um, do you think that was a, really a calculated uh, gamble, or perhaps that's not the right phrase? It was a high risk that... Um, Kalanick felt it was worth taking the risk and trying to manage that risk because of the potential profitability? 
Well, the um, the self-driving car threatens the entire Uber model, um, and Kalanick realized that immediately when Google announced their program. Um, so part of it was was fear, um, part of it was anger, a lot of it was uh, pettiness and pique. So, um, and again, as I said, there's some question as to how far up the chain of command the due diligence report actually made it. But certainly, in, from what I read about that due diligence report, it should have sent up all sorts of red flags and fireworks and everything else about, about getting involved in this. I remember when I first heard about Uber uh, somewhere around uh, 2014 or 2015, and I have a friend who lives in Philly and uh, spent half his time in Philly and uh, in D- uh, New York. And uh, he told me that the cost to take an Uber to LaGuardia, or I guess Newark, uh, was literally half of what a limousine cost. And uh, I immediately thought someone's onto a brilliant business model. What I didn't fully appreciate at the time was Uber was subsidizing uh, those rides, and that's how uh, um, I'm not sure there was a, a net cost which they were below, uh, but uh, they were subsidizing the drivers so the people like me would uh, would try their service out. Sort of point one, point two is early on, I would engage with every Uber driver, and I would basically ask them if if. They enjoyed working for the company. It was a positive experience for them. I found it to be an incredibly positive uh, travel experience. Um, uh, the cars were always clean. I always felt safe. Uh, the drivers always spoke English. Always got me to the place on time. I can only think of one time that uh, they couldn't follow Google Maps. Um, and the, uh, the drivers were being paid uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, as you noted, the uh, payment was almost seamless with the app. And... Uh, I thought Uber was making money. What I didn't appreciate <laughs> at the time was they weren't making money because they were subsidizing this. And I initially thought if you have a company with a product or service, an employee base who is satisfied with a positive customer experience, what's not to love about this? Is it turned out that that model was completely false? I don't think so. I think it was more the the old the time-tested loss leader approach. And they correctly realized that once they got enough people in the city addicted to using the service, that it would be much harder for the regulators to come in and retroactively take it away from people. And so that's why they went in so aggressively and uh, deliberately skirting and violating the law. And there are a couple of other issues, including the use of software to block uh, regulators from seeing the Uber cars and so forth that uh, they got into trouble for as well. But the, um, the initial subsidies were not that great. Um, they gave the drivers iPhones, um, but in part because they were using, when they were still using the livery service model, the livery service cost was so low because they were just, these were cars that weren't being used anyway. Um, so the subsidies only really got out of control when they went into the mass drivers uh, market. And then they had to get into the car leasing in order to give people with no credit rating a car so they could become Uber drivers. One of the other problems was Kalanick really didn't care about the drivers. Um, as an example, there was, was no tipping in the Uber app because he felt it added friction to the user experience. And as a result, the drivers were shortchanged from a, a significant source of income. Um, Lyft, on the other hand, allowed tipping earlier. I never understood why Uber didn't allow tipping um, early on, but uh, they do now. So, and uh, I tip. I, my first trip where I didn't tip this past week or a couple of weeks ago because the driver really pissed me off. <laughs> but other than that, I always tip, and the tipping experience is as seamless as the rest of the experience. I agree. So I don't. I don't get that. But one of the other things that uh, was a huge PR disaster was uh, Kalanick. I believe had been drinking and was with a couple of young ladies in the back of an Uber and got into an argument with the driver over how Uber treated the drivers. And, uh, and that was videoed and went viral again. Um, totally losing is cool, just not really a good PR look. Could we move now to the uh, events right around the time of Kalanick's ouster? Um, 
there seem to be uh, uh, more of these stories coming out. You mentioned the, the filming with the driver. That certainly uh, was a very negative, I think, uh, reputational uh, issue for Kalanick himself. Uh, the board seemed to be uh, losing confidence in his ability. But there was one other factor that uh, I'd like to explore, and it's not something that I don't think we've come up in really any of our leadership discussions, which was the following. Uh, at or near the time of his ouster, and I mean literally the weekend of, uh, I believe his mother was uh, killed in a boating accident. Yes, and his father was very badly hurt. And his father was very badly injured. And uh, obviously that's that's not something you can account for in leadership. That's not th- something you can account for uh, uh, going um, in trying to move forward when your business is in dire straits. But I've always wondered, uh, did those two events impact his decision to fight more or perhaps to, to step back? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, Mike Isaac, the author of Super Pump, really feels that that was instrumental in um, Kalanick agreeing to step down, that uh, it was the first time he'd ever really not fought the way he usually did. And he attributes it to that, and I think that's a perfectly reasonable explanation. Uh, But other things were going on. Uh, One of the early investors was a guy named Bill Gurley with Benchmark Capital. And he'd been sort of a mentor figure for Kalanick early on, and they gradually became estranged over uh, Kalanick's behavior and especially the lack of uh, financial controls. And, you know, Benchmark wanted their money. Uh, This was going to make Gurley a hero and make all their investors a fortune. And they thought that he was becoming a liability. Benchmark actually sued Kalanick for fraud, which was a really interesting move because it damaged their reputation in the uh, VC community as being founder friendly and was a, was a pretty extreme move. And so I think that may also, the estrangement from Gurley may also have been a driving factor. Um, Kalanick was ousted. Uh, the company uh, brought in new, new leadership. They eventually uh, went public um, with the stock losing value almost immediately uh, from the IPO price. But perhaps now, are there any um, lessons that we could t- at least talk about or consider in terms of having a charismatic founder or early leader uh, and then moving towards the position where uh, you do go IPO, and uh, are there, uh, is it really a case-by-case, almost leader-by-leader analysis, or does is the Steve Jobs model simply just a one-off that uh, will be held up uh, forever as the one-off? Well, I think that that's highly debated. The um, Bain Capital has done a study that says founder-run uh, companies do better. Uh, there are other people who dispute that. Um, I think one of the things to learn from this is it just got too far, and I think that's also related to the super voting structure. Um, When SoftBank came in to rescue them, um, it bought 15% of the company and also put another uh, billion and a quarter in cash in. But it came in at a 30% discount to the previous uh, valuation on the the previous round of financing. In that round, uh, Kalanick was able to sell stock and take out uh, almost a billion and a half in cash. Benchmark also got almost a billion in cash and retained a lot of shares for the IPO. Um, Kalanick apparently is now working on Kalanick version 2.0 now that he has the cash and is possibly a nicer person. Um, But basically, everybody took a big hit on this. The IPO valuation was expected to be $120 billion. And by the time everybody looked at the numbers and thought about the management, it was valued at roughly $75 billion when it opened. Opened at 45 It's currently trading under 30 So, well, What about the, uh, the still the service that Uber provided? This is uh, obviously not an Elizabeth Holmes, uh, uh, at least allegations of fraud in the creation of a product or service. It's a tangible service. Uh, you and I both on this podcast have talked about the, how positive we feel it is as a service. I routinely use it um, and will continue uh, to use it going forward. Um, is it uh, something that's here to stay or is this business model just not sustain- sustainable? Well, they're not making money yet, but I, I think they will eventually. Um, 
One of the interesting things is we both love it, but there are several stories in the book about people in Silicon Valley who won't use it, in part because they found the bro culture uh, morally objectionable. And so, I mean, one of the things that, that you see in this is just this hyper-politicization of everything that's going on right now. And so there are people who won't use Uber because of that, and how long they will stay away from it, I don't know. Well, that brings up a really interesting point about, yes, the politicization of, uh, of uh, corporate services. Um, it hasn't reached Houston yet, <laughs> that's all I have to say. So you want to take us home, Richard? Well, I think that uh, Uber's a fascinating case study. I think Super Pumped's a, a good book, despite a couple of the flaws that I've, I mentioned earlier, and it's certainly a lot of fun to read. The role of the charismatic corporate founder remains somewhat, uh, I remain very ambivalent about, and we're going to address it in a couple of other cases. We tend to look at the spectacular failures um, because they're so dramatic, but um, there are lots of them that uh, you know, it, it, it is key to have that uh, monomaniacal focus, uh, at least in the early stages, particularly when you have a business like Uber that's totally disruptive of the uh, existing marketplace. Well, thank you, Richard. I look forward to our next uh, episode. Thank you, Tom. And this, for now, this is 12 O'Clock High with Tom Fox and Richard Lummel. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. Thanks again for listening to this episode of 12 O'Clock High. If you haven't read the book, Super Pumped, I would greatly recommend you do so. We've linked to it in the show notes. Richard and I will be back next week where we take a look at some of the top podcasts and stories and reviews we've had in 2019. Thanks again for listening.